Earlier this year, Emmett and I went through all of Jack Kirby's Fourth World books. Only after we were done with that did we find out about Old Gods and New, a history of the creation of the Fourth World by John Morrow, released last year. This week, Emmett talks with John Morrow about how it was John's interest in Jack Kirby that led to the founding of Two Morrows Publishing, which John runs with his wife. John also talks about how distribution quirks may have inadvertently led to the cancellation of the Fourth World books, how myth runs through all of Kirby's work from the 30s onward, and more. First, if you appreciate the work we do on deconstructing comics on our other podcasts and want bonus content, we'd love it if you'd support the show at patreon.com slash deconcomics for as little as $2 a month. Our monthly issue-by-issue look at 1960s Amazing Spider-Man comics is available to patrons, chipping in at least $4 a month. Coming at the end of this month, we discuss the final Steve Ditko issue. Check out our goals and rewards and pledge your support now at patreon.com slash deconcomics. This is Tim, and this is Deconstructing Comics. Hello, this is Deconstructing Comics at Emino Kuna in the outskirts of Melbourne, Australia, and I am on the call with a Mr. John Morrow from Tomorrow's Publishing. Welcome to the show, John. Why, thank you, Emmett. It's a pleasure to be here, um, despite the time difference between where you are and I am. <laughs> well, thank you for um, agreeing to talk to me. I um, I reached out to you recently just to see if um, you'd be happy to talk to me about your new book, Old Gods and You, which is all about Jack Kirby's New Gods. Uh, and I said to you that we'd recently done a, a series of shows on Deconstructed Comics, myself and Tim, all about Jack Kirby's New Gods and how I was just falling in love with the concept of the new gods and everything he was doing and the story of Jack and the story of Jack with DC and Marvel and everything. Um, and I have to say, I love how in the book you just served all of that, all that up. Just, it was an education for me. Um, really appreciate it. So, um, I'd love to, uh, like hand you the, hand you the mic. Oh, would you talk about tomorrow's publishing your outfit and all the books you've been putting out recently? Well, I would be delighted, um, and I'm especially delighted that you enjoyed that book and that you got some um, knowledge that you didn't have previously from it because I worked very, very hard on that, but I'll get into that later. Um, basically, Tomorrow's Publishing started in 1994, um, and it's all because of Jack Kirby. Jack died in um, – when did he die? He died in no, February of 94. And at that point, I'd pretty much been out of comics since about 1988. I had read like Watchmen and Dark Knight. And at that point, I thought, well, this is about as far as comics can ever go. And I enjoyed them, but I was I was kind of done with them then. And so my wife and I were concentrating on building our little small advertising agency. And um, comics just kind of weren't in the picture for me then. And then and when he passed away in 94, um, my uh, best friend from uh, my grown up years, who knew I was? I had always been a huge Jack Kirby fan. Sent me um, an obituary from the newspaper, and I was like, "Oh, Jack Kirby! Gosh, you know, oh, wow! Um, surely he's still got some fans out there. I, you know, I've got some graphic design skills. Maybe I should do a little, you know, 16-page photocopied newsletter about Jack Kirby just for fun, and um, see if anybody's interested in it. And that's the uh, I, I tell people that my wife was she kind of patted me on the head and said, that's a sweet thing to do, dear. Good. Good for you. Something to keep you busy. Um, and I don't know just how much she regrets okaying that idea at the time, but it's pretty much completely changed the course of both our lives and our and my children as well. So uh, but in a good way. So we, we have uh, from the uh, first issue of the Jack Kirby Collector, which was a 16 page hand photocopied hand stapled thing that I. I sat feeding coins into the copy machine at our local pharmacy uh, to make, a hundred, I think it was 125 copies of the first issue, and then hand-folded them, hand-stapled them, and um, just sent them out to, I think, the 100, it was 125 people who had written tribute letters into the Comics Buyer's Guide publication um, when Jack died. And back then, they included people's addresses, so I had a little mailing list, and I just sent them out at my own expense and waited to see if there was any response. And... Um, uh, I, much to my major surprise, there was a huge response and I thought, wow, well, that's nice. This is great. It'll die down, but it never did die down. It just kept 
people kept sending in money to get a subscription for it. And I kept feeding more coins into the coffee machine at my local pharmacy. And, um, you know, before I knew it, by the sixth issue, uh, I just didn't have time to sit there feeding coins into a coffee machine anymore because uh, we had an advertising business to run. So we decided, okay, we're going to have to splurge and we'll pay to professionally have a printer print issue six. And for that issue, I decided this may be the last one I do because we may lose all of our money doing this thing. So I'm going to make it the best issue ever. And it was going to be all about Jack Kirby's Fourth World Series, which is the new gods and forever people, Mr. Miracle and Jimmy Olsen. And um, the response to that was even greater than the others. From there, we kind of branched out and started uh, doing the publication through comic book stores. Um, and that did well. And from there, we added a second magazine and a third and started publishing some books about comic book history. Um, now, today, let's see, we've been doing this all about 28 years now. And um, hey, we're still going strong. Uh, branched out into a uh, Lego fandom with a Lego publication and books. And now general pop culture as well. We do a magazine called Retro Fan about all the fun stuff that we all, people my age, all grew up with in the 60s and 70s, 80s, all the toys and collectibles and movie stars and TV stars. So um, it's still, it's just been the the most fun uh, career I could have imagined and way more fun than the advertising, which has kind of drifted into the background as publishing kind of came to the foreground and took over. So, um, but yeah, the Jack Kirby's Fourth World stuff, his New Gods material, that was always my favorite Kirby work. And I was just a little too young to buy it brand new off the newsstands. Um, it ended around like 1972 and I started buying Kirby, uh, just after that in, with Commandy, uh, last boy on earth and then worked my way backwards around 1973, starting getting all of Kirby's fourth world books. And since then that's been just a, a major obsession of mine. And that's what led me to do the book that you just read. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, yeah, I, I enjoy just, in, in, in terms of you unpacking that, that history, I, I also enjoy how when I was reading the book, um, at times you editorialize. At times there's these little sort of uh, moments where you sort of butt into the very sort of point for point historical recording of what happened. And then you'll, you'll come in with a little like aside and I'm going, this isn't the academic style. <laughs> this is not well, an academic I tried text. To keep it. Not not too dry and, and yes. boring, yeah. academic. So, um, but I couldn't help it because I'm so I'm just so attached to that material, and I have my own opinions on it. And um, it, you know, I think some people some people have kind of missed the mark on understanding Jack Kirby's Fourth World stuff because they they know Kirby from the 1960s Marvel work he did with Stan Lee. And um, that, you know, rightfully so, Harold, that as as some of his finest work ever. I didn't grow up with that 60s Marvel work. I started with Commandy, of all things, and worked backwards. And, you know, I still have a huge appreciation for the Marvel work. But the Fourth World stuff kind of, I forget who it is that said that whatever you read when you're 15 years old is what you're going to always love the best. And I think that was probably the case for me with the Fourth World stuff. I, I was just consumed with it all and i was consumed with the fact that dc canceled it in mid-story and he never got to finish it and that was just always this kind of a mini obsession of mine to know how he would have ended the thing and that's what i did with issue six of the jack kirby collector i set out to figure out okay how would jack have actually ended this thing and um we sort of found out uh, as much as you can but jack was such a, a an instinctive creator even if what he even if he started out to do what he had in mind for it, say, quote, unquote, final story of the fourth world. By the time he actually sat down with a pencil and a piece of Bristol board and drew it, the story could have come out completely different. He was just that instinctive. And so, you know, but but in talking to his associates and you know other people involved in the book, uh, and we we kind of discerned how he probably would have ended if he'd have been able to end it at the time, as opposed to in 1984, when he's kind of pseudo ended it with a lot of restrictions. So, yeah. And it's funny as well, just in terms of the new gods as a concept, I um coming up as a comic book fan, you know, whenever I heard of the new gods, it was usually in this sort of, Oh, that's that weird thing over there. We don't really talk about it that much. Or <laughs> there was almost this hint of embarrassment about it with certain 
Um, and this is where you, the problem you have when you have got a limited select group of people actually doing the reporting on comics and the sort of advocacy for comics. You're, you're, you're reliant on their opinions. Um, what I love about this book is how much you let Jack speak. A lot of it is just direct quotes from him, from interviews you've pulled um, that he's given to magazines or fanfic, um, fan fiction publications. There's one quote here I, I want to read out because I think it sort of nails his thinking and how thoughtful he was and, and the, almost the philosophy uh, behind New Gods as a 20th, 20th century invention. Um, he says, We can't be Thor. We can't be Odin anymore. We're not a bunch of guys running around in bearskins. We're guys that wear spacesuits and surgeons' masks. A surgeon is godlike because he handles life and death. If you want to idealize him, that's the way to do it. A nuclear physicist is Metron. A mathematician is Metron. A guy who walks, works a projection booth in a theater is Metron. We're trying to know everything. We've got the equipment to do it. That's where Metron's chair comes in. It's one of our gadgets that damn chair can do anything. And when Tim and I were reading you gods, I kept saying to him, I, I don't know if Jack Kirby's read Martin Heidegger or if he's read lots of existentialist philosophy, but I'm feeling that from this work. There's this sense of technology, how humanity interfaces with technology is going to change us fundamentally. And that seems to be a theme, certainly with Metron. And he's, his understanding of what myth is, the idea of what myth does for humanity is very present in that passage. Um, the stories we tell of ourselves that make sense of our reality in that moment. Mm. Um, how, is this this is this is where I get excited about Kirby? I, I feel like he's somebody who's tra wrestling with his time. Well, yeah, um, and right. At, what, what did he? What was his tagline for the series? This is an epic for our times. Mm. Was the the initial blurb that he used to promote it? Um, and it was. It was all about. This is our new mythology. That was the whole idea of new gods as opposed to old gods. And um, he, he, Jack was re remarkably well read. I mean, to be a guy who grew up in the slums of New York City in the 1920s and 30s um, he, and, and who worked all the time, I'm still flabbergasted when I'm finding things, references to things that he had to have read in order to convey in his comics. Uh, when did he find time to read? <laughs> I, I don't know. And and his family associates aren't really quite sure either. Uh, some, he, I don't think the guy ever slept, frankly. He must not have because there just weren't enough hours in the day for him to draw as much as he did, even as fast as he was, and still have time to spend with his family and, 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 and read as much as he did. Um, but, yeah, the, the, the whole – New God's epic, and it's called the Fourth World. And there's we talk about that in the book of why in the world is it called the Fourth World? Is it because there's third world countries, and this is the Fourth World? There's there's uh, several different interpretations of where that name came from, um, and and we talk about them in the book. But uh, regardless, Steve Sherman, his, one of his assistants at the time, said he thinks Jack just thought that sounded cool. There wasn't any real meaning behind it. Um, of course, one of the other things is that uh, which we kind of went into depth on was that it was a typo on a cover of Jimmy Olsen that caused it. Um, you know, read the book and you can decide which one of the possible answers makes sense. But in any case, it was something he was trying to do something completely different in comics. And he did. At that point, no one had ever done four continuing series that all tied together into one kind of story tapestry. And um, it, it was totally unique for its time. And, you know, since then, right, we've seen Crisis on Infinite Earths, which is one long maxi series. I'm trying to think if we've seen anything that really is still comparable to what Jack was doing, four different titles all interweaving into one story. Wait, what we sort of talked about during our discussion of the New God stuff was how much Morrison was trying to resurrect that with his seven, so with their seven soldiers series where they mm -hmm. seem to be yeah. not only using Kirby concepts in almost every one of the seven soldiers titles, but also they had this idea of we'll do these stories and then we'll hand them over to you. And then you keep doing these stories, which mm -hmm. I took from your reporting as well. This idea of Kirby almost being the creative director, managing these concepts initially and then handing them over to other creative teams. But then, they just wanted Kirby on these books because Kirby's name sells books. 
Well, and they were also paying Kirby, you know, probably the top rate in the industry at the time. And so they didn't want him just creative directing other people on his ideas. They, they like you said, Kirby sold and they knew he sold great for Marvel. And they, you know, the people behind the scenes knew how intimately Kirby was involved in the creation of all that Marvel stuff that was so successful in the 60s. Um, they knew Jack was the I mean, was really the creative powerhouse behind that much more so than Stan in terms of conceptualizing and just coming up with these these expansive worlds that no one had ever thought of before. And, you know, metallic guys on surfboards surfing through outer space. I mean, no one's ever, ever come up with something like that up until Jack did. So. Um, so, yeah, they really wanted him producing the books. And and I personally am glad. I don't think I would have nearly enjoyed the Fourth World series as much, even if it were somebody as great as, you know, Wally Wood drawing Mr. Miracle, for instance, or they talked about, uh, you know, Jack considered uh, if he could get him, get Steve Ditko to do Mr. Miracle, I think. And, um, you know, Wood was maybe going to do the new gods. And I think he wanted to get Don Heck to do the forever people. I, I forget exactly what some of the ideas that were bandied about. There were that those were some of them, but none of them ever, ever came to fruition because DC and Carmen Infantino would say, sure, Jack, we'll work on that. And then would never kind of, you know, flip the switch on a lot of what Jack wanted to do. So he ended up, you know, instead, well, if I've got to do them, I'm going to make them interesting for me. And he certainly did. I, I, you know, those, those books are so great. It's just, it's so sad that they were reaching these peaks and then DC kind of pulled the rug out from under him um, on the last couple of issues, making him change directions on things and then outright canceling most of the series. So, yeah, it's, it's, that's where I feel, the uh, the too many eggs in one basket approach kind of ruined the whole project. Um, you're you're leaning so hard on Kirby to produce all these works, and he's he's a, he'll do it, but then the commercial reality just immediately conflicts with whatever he's doing. Well, I, okay, I would take issue with that. I don't okay. think it was too many eggs in one basket. I think it was too many cooks in the kitchen. Ah. I think <laughs> they should have just left Jack the heck alone yeah. <laughs> and let him keep doing the books. Um, but there were a lot of um, financial considerations that, that that apparently the higher ups of DC weren't aware of. And there's a whole series of um, comics history pieces on the whole uh, distribution business at that time and how the, the fledgling um, comic book dealers uh, market was starting to form. And they would go to the distributors warehouses and buy the hot selling what they thought would be the hot selling books in big bundles direct from the distributor out the back door, pay a less for, lesser price for it, and the distributor would report them as unsold and that they destroyed them, which they didn't. Um, so the sales were deceptively low on things like Kirby's Fourth World, uh, Neil Adams' Green Lantern, Green Arrow series. I'm trying to remember what else was coming out at that time. Um, things that just common sense says these should be the top selling books out there on the market today. Uh, Kirby and Adams were the hottest things going. And their books, based on DC sales figures, did not sell well. And we now know that there was some shenanigans going on with the distribution, and a lot of the sales didn't get reported. And, in fact, they were, instead of not being reported as sales, they were reported as destroyed copies. And uh, so the, the bottom line for DC looked bad on these books that were actually doing much better than they thought. So if they had <laughs> gotten a grasp of what was actually going on with sales then and let Kirby continue – on the path he was going because he reached a total pinnacle of storytelling around the eighth issue of each of his titles. And uh, it, it, who knows where it could have gone from there. But instead at that point, Carmen Infantino got involved, you know, panicked when he saw some sales figures that weren't necessarily accurate and said, Oh, you got to stick dead man in the new gods. Well, that was a strange fit. Well, actually I think he wanted to put dead man in forever. For, you know, he wanted to put dead man in new gods. That's right. And Jack said, hey, that's not going to work. I'll stick him in forever people instead, which still didn't exactly fit. But, um, and then a couple issues later, the whole thing was canceled, except for Mr. Miracle continued. But the edict from Carmine was, yeah, we'll continue Mr. Miracle, but you can't tie it into the whole fourth world thing. You just have to make it, you know, boring, mundane superhero stories of this guy that escapes traps. And so then Mr. Miracle continued an extra year, year and a half, I guess, with some really lackluster, dull stories that are no one's favorites. And, um, Finally, they completely pulled the plug on it, but let Jack wrap up, <laughs> sort of wrap up the story in the last Mr. Miracle issue, number 18. Um, and that was the end of it, we thought. And from then it was like, oh, Jack will never get to finish his epic. So, But then in 1984, um, 
DC Comics new management with Paul Levitz and Jeanette Kahn and Dick Giordano went to Jack and said, hey, we, we want to do right by you. We want to give you a chance to wrap this up, um, do a miniseries. Uh, that was at the time of the Superpowers series. We'll let you work on that and give you some ownership stake by redesigning a couple of the characters so you can get royalties since you didn't have royalties back in the 70s. And I'll also give you a graphic novel as you wrap this thing up. And at that point, Jack was, I mean, he was at the tail end of his career. He was still in the animation industry, but wasn't doing much in comics. But he decided to do it because it sounded like a great opportunity to get a little closure on it. And um, produced a, a, a nice, decent sort of ending, but it didn't really end it because there were so many restrictions at that point. At that point, Darkseid had become DC's big villain. So, and I think Jack's original plan was Darkseid or Orion one was going to die at the end, maybe both. And that was certainly no way you cannot kill off Darkseid. We have too much invested in him now. Um, so he had to kind of alter his plans. And the, the final story was, uh, it, it was interesting, but it, I don't think hardcore fans like myself and a lot of others felt like that really did justice to the series. But Jack viewed it as a finite series anyway, and it probably wouldn't have continued and DC has milked the concepts and the characters, you know, <laughs> they've made a lot of money off of Jack's ideas from the fourth world. And, um, you know, they're, they're not going to kill them off. They'll never end. They'll just keep going on and on and on. So, yeah, again, they're, they're now in movies. They're now in, in animated shows, video games. They, these concepts just keep getting used and more and more, they dig more and more into what he left them. Um, I loved the idea uh, that they, you, you talk about it in the book, but it was something when we were reading the issues when Darkseid resurrects his lackeys. I really yes. loved that sequence because there's, they were just repeating catchphrases. They're incomplete clones. Um, you are. <laughs> they're, they're just they're facsimiles of who they were. And I really enjoyed it. I thought, oh, that's a fantastic idea. Like this, He can't create anything. He can just create almost like he's not interested in creation really so these are just like these badly copied versions of the these individuals who worked once worked for him and then in your book you've got the note that um well the resurrections were due to the toy merchandising deal almost like right and i i feel like again he's he's an instinctive creator but there's so much like insight in that little detail this idea of, okay, well, I have to bring these characters back because they're in the toy deal. All right, well, they will come back, but they're not quite right. <laughs> There's something wrong with them. Yeah, right. And you could argue that that was an intentional, mm. um, like, political statement on Jack's part. Or maybe it just seemed like the thing to do. I, I don't know. Um, Jack tended, he could tend to sneak little things in and make kind of editorial comments through his work, uh, little subtle jabs at things. And that, that probably was one. You know, we don't know for sure, but it makes sense that it would be. And... Hey, you know, the guy, he had an amazing career dating back to, I think his first comics work was 1939 um, and worked in his last comics work was 80, 1986. So that's a that's a pretty good career. And despite a few disappointments, I think, well, I know he was very appreciative of the gesture that DC made, letting him kind of come back and craft the story that he was able to craft to kind of wrap things up. And, you know, it made a little money for him and his family. Um, you know, <laughs> I, it, you you can't argue with the, um, the the motivation that DC had for that. They really were trying to do right by him, and they did as best as they could in light of things. So I, I, I props to Paul Levitz and Jeanette Kahn. Yeah. Um, again, towards the end of the book, you talk about that moment when Mark Venier calls Roz to let her know that they're going to be republishing uh, all of the New Gods material in these collected mm -hmm. collected works and it's very you know this heartfelt moment where she she's like oh he, jack always knew that this this day would come that you always knew that this this work would come out in this format i was very surprised when you go back to the days with marvel when he's looking to find a safe home to jump to and people are making pitches to him oh come work for us come work for us he's telling people at that and we're ta that's what that's the late sixties now, he's telling right. people don't get into the comics business, don't go into publishing comics through this these distribution hubs because it's it's a rort. Publish through the book selling business. So right. I feel like he's anticipating the graphic novel as a concept over a decade before it it really 
gains momentum and starts coming out. I know people argue as to who came up with the first graphic novel, but like it seems like he's his head's already there. That's what he's thinking of. Well, yeah, and he knew it was a rigged business. I mean, um, the, that whole problem with the distribution selling out the back door to comics dealers is a great example. Um, I know we 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 uh, distribute a, a couple of our magazines through the bookstore market, and we deal with a big distributor, and it's such a crazy racket to uh, you know you send them. X number of copies, and if they don't destroy 60% of those and charge you um, fees on 60 to 65% of them that they don't sell, you're doing pretty well. Um, so, you know, the whole the advent of the whole direct market thing was one reason I think DC was able to offer Jack an opportunity to 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 come and kind of wrap up the fourth world stuff. Um, they had the the comic book market um, you know, marketplace, the comic book store marketplace available and they could you know that that opened up a lot of possibilities for dc and marvel in terms of okay we can print more niche product and only print x number of copies just to the hardcore fans of the shopping comic stores we're not worried about you know whether this new gods revival is going to sell well at uh you know, on a newsstand or at a you know a local convenience store or something like that and um jack jack was very prescient in a lot of ways, you know, he foresaw what the San Diego Comic Con would would become way before it ever had more than 300 people show up for it. Now it's got 160,000 people, I think, that show up every summer. Um, you know, he, and he foretold to several people what he envisioned about, you know, comics on better paper, better coloring in bookstores. Um, and, you know, now that's commonplace for us. But if you think about 1967, 68, and he was saying this. Everybody were like, yeah, right, Jack. Sure, that's going to happen. Um, he was a remarkable guy, and not just in the way he could draw or he could conceptualize. Coming up, controversy about how Kirby wrote, mythology in all of Kirby's work, the existential dread at Marvel when Kirby left for DC, and more. But first, a reminder to join us for 20th Century TV and Music Trivia Quiz videos and more on our Patreon page. Every month, patrons donating $4 a month or more also get a full-length podcast episode reviewing an issue of The Amazing Spider-Man by Lee and Ditko, and will continue through the transition to John Romita Sr. Check out our goals and rewards at patreon.com slash deconcomics. If you'd rather give a one-time donation, you can do so via PayPal by sending it to mail at deconstructingcomics.com. We appreciate your support. Hi, I'm Sophie, and I haven't seen a lot of movies. Hi, I'm Paul, and I'm here to help with that. And we are SP Film Viewers. Each week, we take a deep dive into films that Sophie is seeing for the first time, some of which are deemed classics, some of which are my favourites, and some are just to try and get a reaction from her. We don't take ourselves too seriously, but we have a lot of fun talking about what we've watched. And we hope you have fun listening to our light-hearted thoughts and ramblings on this cinematic journey. So tune in every Thursday on Apple Podcast, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts from. A lot of people don't like the way he, if you want to call it that, wrote. And by that, I mean the actual filled in the, the dialogue words and the word balloons. A lot of people didn't care for that. I was kind of raised on that, so I wasn't raised on, you know, Stan Lee's little quippy way of writing. Um, I discovered that later. So seeing Kirby's actual dialogue never threw me for a loop at all. Occasionally there was an odd thing. I go, oh, why is that in quotes or why is that in bold type or something? But um, I always thought he told a great story, both you know visually and with the written word. So, um, you know, but there's a lot of people that go, oh, Jack couldn't write. And I'm, I'm sorry, I have to take issue with that. Just because you don't like his style doesn't necessarily mean he can't write. Um, and I think Jack's written words hold up a lot better over time than a lot of Stan Lee stuff do, frankly. So, I mean, we go back to where did he find the time to read thing? Because that idea of putting uh, certain words and quotes, I mean, that's very common in um, older writing, particularly in, in philosophy as well. This idea of I'm now introducing a concept quotes mm -hmm. you know that's that's how the that's right. how the writer would indicate to the reader now we're going to be talking about this this idea um and that's where i feel that comes from as well so he, he's clearly drawing on an eclectic array of sources and um one note you make uh which uh, 
mentioning Stan Lee sort of brings us onto this track because particularly with Thor, Stan Lee would tell the story about, oh, well, I was always interested in Shakespeare and mythology, and that's where Thor comes from. Whereas in this book, you trace this lineage of Kirby's use of mythology from his very early comics work all the way up to Marvel and on. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's the spine of the book, uh, his interest in mythology. And one aside you introduce is Captain America's mask even features Mercury's wings above the ears, which is such a lovely... Like, there's the proof. That's where his head is. He's thinking these terms. Um, he's thinking about modernizing mythology with Captain America. He's thinking of introducing Thor into his comics from, from the early work he's doing. Thor comes up two or three times. Um, so this idea that Stan Lee sort of came up with Thor, you know, sweet, generous, whatever, he just has the idea. Kirby's already at the coalface with these concepts. Well, he also actually did... Thor as a precursor uh, to his Marvel one at DC Comics. Um, and he did, um, let's see, I mean, well, you're talking about Captain America number one back in 1940, was it 41? Um, and Cap had the little wings on his on his mask. That you know, that could have been Joe Simon's idea to put that on there. But regardless, in the same issue, there's Mercury in the 20th century, which is a backup strip in Captain America number one. And it is literally Mercury with the helmet with the wings um, zipping along, talking to talking to Zeus. And um, so, I mean, Jack was doing mythology in comics before Stanley even wrote his first comic book. So there's no doubt that Jack used mythology his entire career long before Thor even, and certainly long before the new gods. So it was certainly an interest of his and, and uh, there, there's just no denying that. And so, you know, I, I think Stan saying Shakespeare is where Thor came from. Well, Shakespeare may be where Stan got some of the patter that he uh, wrote some of the dialogue with. Certainly um, he may have modeled it based on that, but the concepts totally uh, fall back to Jack. And if you look at the first few issues of Thor, even, which we kind of talk about in the book, um, it was pretty mundane. Uh, it, it wasn't as steeped in mythology, obviously. They slowly introduced Loki. They slowly introduced Odin. Um, and um, it wasn't until Jack got to do the Tales of Asgard backups in Thor that all of a sudden it came full on Odin, Asgard, um, the whole Viking mythology. It, it was just steeped in it. And Stan was not directing that at all. Um, so if you, you know, it, it, there, there's just no doubt that the mythological undertrappings of this work of all these creations really started with Jack. So, yeah. And even with that first issue of Thor, I mean, the, the villains are space aliens and like when, <laughs> y y you know, he's already thinking of this idea of what is myth in our time because he keeps mixing in science fiction and Asgard is shown to be a super sophisticated technological um, alien civilization. It's not, the, th the Asgard of myth, uh, but it draws on the Asgard of myth. Uh, so he's he's sort of he's I I love that the the seas for new gods are already there. Like the, this this sort of and people keep talking. You, you dress it in the book as well. People keep talking about oh well Jack Kirby inspired Star Wars and Star Wars again was being celebrated as oh this space opera with mythological themes and this idea of religion the jedi and the uh the 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 hero in luke skywalker he's the hero type going back to all the way back to hercules and all these kind of i went to an exhibition in dublin at star wars and they went all in on the joseph campbell monomyth which <laughs> it was very irritating mm -hmm. uh, but um i was oh was there something in the water at the time or was it jack kirby or were, was there a general interest in this because i also grew up on an animated show which is a french japanese animated show called ulysses 31 where you took the greek myth of ulysses and you set in the 31st century and you had the idea of spacefaring gods and you had the, these super sophisticated um god-like space uh empires that feels a bit like kirby but i'm also sure if the guys making ulysses 31 were reading kirby or is it something that was also out there People are just thinking of gods in this way. Well, I mean, the fact that Jack pioneered putting this stuff in comics would lead me to say that there's some influence. Maybe it's very indirect, you know, roundabout through two other influences. 
But nobody, just like the Silver Surfer, nobody put a guy on a surfboard surfing through space until Jack threw it in the Fantastic Four. Before then, it, that, that was just such a mind-blowing concept for comics. No one would dry, do something that outrageous and expect people to buy it. And they did buy it because Jack sold it so convincingly. Um, so the, the whole New Gods thing, you know, he experimented with, minted with the whole idea of gods on Earth, obviously, in the 60s with Thor. But And he certainly wasn't the first person to use mythology in comics, but he was the first person to use it the way he used it. And, and to expound upon that and, you know, take it a step forward into modern times and even theoretically a step forward into what it would be in the future. So, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me that that strip that you're talking about, which I assume was in the 80s at some point uh, in the 1980s, would, would have had some at least indirect influence from Kirby's earlier work. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to quickly touch on as well is the dark side of it all. Um, Mm-hmm. Dark side as a character, Dark side as this continuing money maker for DC and in you know, all the various multimedia projects. He's he's now landed on the big screen. It was a bit a bit of a disappointment, but he's definitely there. Uh, well, the, the semi the, the little screen, depending on how big it is in your house. Yes, so. oh, the, the little the um, animated Dark side is not too bad. Um, but I um I, I th- you have this quote. I think it's Kirby being interviewed by Vanier and Marv Wolfman in 1986. What Darkseid stands for is what I've been fighting all my life. I've always wanted to be left alone. A dark side won't leave you alone. A dark side wants what you've got just because you, you've got it. He doesn't know any way to live except to get as much as he can. And not only is that a fantastic concept for this particular villain, it feels so of a moment right now. It feels so like we are now at the mercy of all these ideologues and monomaniacs in our media and our politics who just just want everything. Um, and I, I don't have the quote here, but you had something from Kirby where he said, I don't think we'll actually see something like Dark Side. And I, I had a chill went down my spine. And I was going, Jack, no, we've got loads of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jack fought in World War Two, so um, he had a good taste of Hitler firsthand. And um, I'm sure that had to, like it did most anybody else that lived through that experience, that, that had to affect how he viewed people and entities in position of power. Uh, and there's benevolent, powerful entities, and there are the other kind. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of the people running comics companies were the other type. Um, and, and with what he went, I, I mean, he, he had so many frustrations working at Marvel in the 60s. It's no wonder that Darkseid came out of his imagination because he's kind of sort of the sum total of all the frustrations that he dealt with um, throughout his career in the comics industry up to that point. And also, according to Mark Evanier, you know, a lot of the political stuff with uh, with Nixon and other things that were going on around that time came out in that character. But the character, yeah, he's still relevant today. I mean, but there is good grief. There is um, uh, there's an issue of Jack's other series, OMAC that uh, somebody wrote in and said, look, OMAC number two, there's Donald Trump right there at the, at the villain in OMAC number two. And I'm like, well, yeah, I can definitely see that. I'm hesitant to put too much of a, you know, uh, one to one fortune telling yeah. uh, twist on everything Jack said. I think Jack was just a very perceptive guy and he knew human nature very well. And he knew that there are people in this world like dark side and there always will be. And we're always going to have to, you know, slap them down when they rise to power. And um, so the fact that we're that you're seeing people today that are like, oh, that's Jack foretold this guy. Yeah, but he foretold the guy that's going to be doing that 20 years from now and 50 years from now and 100 years from now, because that's human nature. Jack knew human nature very well, particularly the dark side of human nature. And I imagine that's where the name dark side came from. Um, Jack was just channeling the dark side of human nature. So. Mm. Yeah, no, that, that's that's fair, and I think that's that's what makes him a compelling antagonist. But I also just love how in the comics he just comes off as really petty, <laughs> and then like you 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 were you wrote off the latter half of the Mister Miracle run, and like I I you know I I, I know where you're coming from there, but I I genuinely love the last page of the Mister Miracle series where where Darkseid just he's just a, he's a petty bitch. He's like I ruined the wedding, ha ha. <laughs> I love that. I think it's great. <laughs> oh, I love that last issue. That was such a nice 
you know, last little uh, salve on the wounds of having the series canceled. But, um, but yeah, no, that last page is great. Yeah. It's like, I, yep, you, you got away from me, but I did manage to spoil your happiness. So, and so it's sad that there's so many people like that, that just want to ruin things for others just for the sake of ruining them. Like you said, Jack said, he, the dark side just wants what you wants what you have just because you have it. And he doesn't. So, um, yeah, I, I hate people like that personally, but <laughs> You know, that's that's part of life. We we all have to deal with them. Yeah, and and um, there was something else. Just I've seen people talk about this now more and more. Um, I've seen even YouTube videos about this, but the the sort of Vince Coletta controversy with Kirby's work mm. and the um, poor rendering of Kirby's work. That's what I was familiar with, but I did not know that um, so much of his stuff was just being taken straight to Marvel and being displayed in the Marvel office. And there's a, <laughs> there's a cruelty to that too. Like I, I kind of like Jack's like that line where he says, um, I just want to be left alone. I, I, I get that there too. It's like, what are they doing to this man? Or they, they, I know it's like opposition research, but it's, it's, there's a cruelty to it that I find like unbelievable. Like this is his collaborator. His collaborator is going to the, uh, the, the rivals and, explicitly the ones who are competing with him and he's saying here's everything jack's working on right now well you've got to realize in 1970 when it was announced that jack kirby was leaving marvel to go to dc there were some very very nervous people at, at marvel comics least of all was not stan lee um where they were sweating very profusely uh when jack left because um the, the thought was oh my gosh they may put us out of business they've got kirby and um, I, yeah, so many of the creators then were like, yeah, this is <laughs> we may as well just close up Marvel. I, I know uh, well, John Romita got the Fantastic Four job after Jack left and Stan called him into his office. And Romita talks about that. He says and he says, yes, Stan, what are we going to do? I guess we're just going to have to cancel Fantastic Four. And Stan's like, no, you're going to do it. He says, I I'm not. Nobody can do Fantastic Four. It's, that's Jack. You know, uh, they, they were convinced that. Jack had the possibility to put Marvel out of business and who knows, maybe if they'd let him run with his original ideas on things, who knows, maybe it would have, I don't know. DC just wasn't a forward thinking enough company to do that, but Marvel wasn't either. Marvel let him go. Um, you know, if they'd have made him a, a, a better financial deal and a better working situation at Marvel in like 1967, when they sold the company, Jack would have stayed there. He might've done these fourth world series there, or it would have turned into something even more grandiose. But they they were happy to let him just keep churning out Thor stories and Fantastic Four stories every month. And it shows in that later late 60s Marvel work, Jack was just kind of you know going through the paces with the stories. He was not introducing any new characters, any great new concepts. He'd just tell a decent story in each issue and move on to the next. And he was biding his time until a better opportunity came and he could unleash his imagination again, which DC's offer wasn't a it, it sounded better at first. Um, but they didn't, they didn't come through on everything they promised him, but you know, it was certainly better than what he had at Marvel and he had had his fill of Stanley and Marvel and Martin Goodman at that point and decided to try it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad he did because that resulted in my favorite comics of all time. Um, you know, I just, I wish he hadn't had the frustrations he had, but you know, he had a lot of successes in his career and a lot of happiness. And, um, I'm just, I'm right now working on a new issue of the Jack Kirby collector magazine that focuses all on his animation career in the 1980s. And the happy ending is that in spite of all the frustrations and even what he was going through while he was in the animation industry trying to get his original art back from Marvel, he had such a, a joyous, wonderful experience working in animation for like Ruby Spears in the 80s. He he really had a, a, a really nice coda on his life. Um, it ended well for him career-wise, family-wise. Um, you know, he went out on a high note, and um, the, the fact that Ross said, yes, Jack always knew they would reprint this stuff, I, I genuinely think he knew that. I think he went to his to his grave knowing my stuff will be appreciated the full way I wanted it to sooner or later. And, you know, we're just now seeing it. It's it's And we're going to see I, if, if Daggum Warner Brothers would ever get their act together, we would see a proper New Gods movie. Um, you know, I, I've heard, I, I'm with people who say they should just just hire Paul Dini and Bruce Tim, let them take over the entire Warner Brothers movie uh, franchises and let them run the show. 
I, I think they could blow Marvel's movies out of the water with those two guys in charge because they, they love the material and they have respect for the material and they know how to move the material forward. And, you know, but they're they're just so short sighted at, at DC's film division. So we'll see. Maybe time will tell. And all of Jack's creations will eventually make it to the big screen in, in, in a respectful manner that does them justice. I love that. I think we're I think we can we can wrap up with that. Um John, let, let the folks know what what are you guys coming out next? Um well, let's see. Actually, as I speak, we're about 2 days away from unveiling our um 2020 or 2023 new releases on our web store. Our website is www.tomorrows.com and that's spelled T W O M O R R O W S.com. Um, so by the time you hear this, um, check out our website. You'll see what we got coming up for the next, you know, 12 months. Um, we'll be adding a few as we go on, but that's the ones we have locked down, including, let's see, one, two, three Jack Kirby related books and three new issues of the Jack Kirby Collector magazine. So if you're a Kirby fan, check it out and get excited about what we're about to work on and, um, and what I'm going to be losing sleep over for the next 12 months. So. <laughs> Well, well, thank you for uh, all the work you're doing and, and putting the focus back on Jack. And also thank you for this book. I, I just love how much you gave the floor to him to speak his own words and just how much of that was just him demonstrating how much of a thoughtful person he was and um, a warm person as well. It really came through in his relationships with uh, the fans and uh, with, with Vanier and, and all, all the his collaborators, Steve Sherman as well. Um, I think he did a good job of sort of portraying him in a um, not flattering, um, uh, respectful light. And he came through. Well, thanks. Yeah. Old Gods and New by John Morrow is published by Two Morrows. You can help the Deconstructing Comics family of podcasts by joining us on Patreon at patreon.com slash deconcomics. And go to deconstructingcomics.com to connect to us on Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube, to shop on Amazon to support the show, and to find links to subscribe to the podcast. Our theme is by J.B. Anderton. If you're looking for some constructive feedback on your comic, send it to us and we'll critique it on our spinoff podcast, Critiquing Comics. Send it to mail at deconstructingcomics.com. We'll read it and record our critique. It's been a while since we talked about Charles Schultz and Peanuts on the show, so next week we're going to remedy that. The topic is very specific. Dialogue-free Sunday Peanuts strips from the period of 1957 through 1961. We'll talk about what these strips tell us about Schultz's storytelling and about specific characters, what earmarks them as being from this era of Peanuts, and more. So join us next week for Schultz's Silent Sundays. Till then, this is Tim, and thanks for listening to Deconstructing Comics.